Hello. Simon Reeves travels to East Africa for a new series of holidays in the danger zone. There are almost 200 official countries in the world today, but there are dozens more breakaway states, determined to be separate, but officially not recognised. Some survive peacefully with their own borders, money and presidents, but others are a magnet for terrorists and weapon smuggling and have armies ready for a fight. Welcome to places that don't exist. Somalia is one of the poorest and most dangerous countries in the world. But within this land, there's a stable working democracy, a breakaway state called Somaliland, which no other nation recognises as a proper country. On my way there, I passed through Mogadishu, the war-ravaged capital of Somalia, where I met my guide. Hi. Hi. Did you? Hi. How are you? I'm very well. It's Canada. Yeah. yeah. I just welcome Mogadishu. Nice to see you. Yeah. Hello. This is Mogadishu. International Airport. I don't know if you can hear the gunfire in the background. You don't walk around Mogadishu without armed protection. When was the last time you were involved in any uh, action, any trouble? The last time I remember, I was just hanging around with another journalist and we were attacked. You're worried about me falling off? Yeah. We've got so many guards with us and we're just trying to keep everybody in. It feels remarkably safe what we're doing. Here, it's quite safe. But in fact, when we're traveling uh, center of the town, it's not good because I attract eyes. Yeah. View. Yeah. And well, they don't see there's not many white guys in Mogadishu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think now you are the only people, uh, only white person around him, only you. We're the only white people in the whole of Mogadishu. Yeah, yeah. It's a city of a million like people. Mogadishu is in a state of anarchy. There's no real government in Somalia, and instead warlords control their own territory. We've come to the main market in Mogadishu. It's actually the biggest market in Somalia. It's a little bit crazy. As you can see, we've got our guards with us. They're going to be with us the whole time we're here, and hopefully they're going to look after us. Who are these guys? So these business people. So be careful here, because there's guys on the back of the pickup with, uh, with heavy guns. So these guys on my right now have all got guns. Apparently are bodyguards for a rich businessman. But well, they're not so keen on being filmed and we don't really want to annoy them. I think he just hit his gun on your leg. Wait, did he just hit his gun on your leg? So be careful where you point the camera in. All right. Put it down, 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 down! Wait, we're just filming outside a money transfer agency. A lot of Somalis are getting money from their family who've traveled abroad to work and hundreds of millions of dollars is brought back to the country by people who are working in Europe and the rest of Africa. And just as we were filming the agency, though, a guard took offense and started cocking his gun right at us. Somalia has been largely abandoned by the rest of the world since the early 90s, when American troops led a failed UN attempt to bring order to the country. After a battle with local warlords, the bodies of American servicemen were dragged through the streets here and American forces were withdrawn. Everyone else soon followed. If you've seen the film Black Hawk Down, this is where the fighting actually started. American forces landed on this building here to try and capture some, some senior Somali warlords. And they failed to capture the ones they were really after, but it started a huge battle in which several hundred people died in the streets around here. This is the site where one of the American helicopters came down. And was there a, there was a battle around here? Yeah, I think it's all, all around here. Are these bullet holes? See here, these are all bullet holes in the wall. You can see the scale of the, the ferocity of the fighting. 
that's the wing of the helicopter. You see, still left there. So it's incredible. This is actually where the carcass of the helicopter is in here, and all these cactus plants have grown up around it. What do they think about Black Hawk Down? Do they think it was a victory for America or a victory for Somalia? Or they're saying, hey, this is the American helicopter. They're remembering, I mean, every time. So they think this is where they think America lost in Mogadishu. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Because there's no government in Somalia, it can be very hard for people to get passports to travel out of the country. Instead of a government ministry, anyone with money goes to see men like Mr. Big Beard. Hello, Mr. Big Beard. Lovely to meet you. Yeah. Simon. Simon. That's Simon. So these are the Somali passports. Yeah. And this is what people in Somalia have to do. They have to come and get one of these passports and, and buy it, basically. It's not, they're not able to apply to a government for a passport because there isn't a government. So they have to come to Mr. Big Beard and he will give them a passport. It's a big head. Big head. Oh, I see. Oh, dear. Oh. It's OK? It's OK. And can I be the ambassador? The ambassador, the Somali ambassador to the United Kingdom? No, no, no. Ambassador of uh, Nairobi. Ambassador in Kenya? Kenya. Yeah. OK, just like that. I'm now a Somali diplomat. Businessmen in Somalia are hiring their own small armies and fighting back against the warlords. A port is operating outside Mogadishu, away from the areas they control. We've got ships that are anchored out at sea, and then we've got smaller boats. They look like military landing craft, actually, that are bringing the goods closer to shore. And then porters manually unload them. There's just scores of men ferrying the goods back and forward between the boats and the lorries, which are just over there behind us. So on here we've got rice and tea, basmati rice from India, which has been brought over, and spaghetti as well. Turkey. Spaghetti from Turkey. Turkey. This is globalization for you. One of the few goods Somalia has left to export is rusting scrap metal. What is on the, the machine over there? It looks like the bottom of a, yeah, bottom an of armored, armored personnel carrier, yeah. something like this. Where does it go to? To India. It goes to India. Is today a particularly busy day? It's normal. It's, it is normal. Today. This is a normal day yeah, today. Yeah, normal day. Yeah. So, how many how many men do you have working in the port? Uh, uh, around four thousand. Four thousand. Four thousand. We just said you wanted. Ooh. Guy just cocking his gun. I think he was just trying to keep the crowd back. But... The sound of making the gun. Yeah. People, they're afraid. They I know. Yeah. Me too. Okay. <laughs> I left the chaos of Mogadishu and headed north to Somali land, which I'd been told was stable and relatively peaceful. When I arrived, I found it wasn't always that way. Somali land split from Somalia and declared independence in 1991, but then had to fight a war against the Somali dictator, Mohamed Siad Barre. My new guide, Yusuf, spent 10 years fighting in that civil war. Somaliland gained independence from Britain in 1960, then joined with Somalia to form one country. When the relationship soured, the civil war began. Somaliland also saw fighting during the Second World War. The British and the Italians fought a battle here. Yes. And Somaliland soldiers were involved in the battle. Thousands of Somalilanders came to the support of Britain, although Britain never reciprocated that. They never came to our aid when we were fighting here against the terrible dictatorship of Mohammed Siad Barre during the 80s. Does it make you angry with Britain? Well, uh, 
not really angry. I'm angry mo uh, more because Britain is not recognizing Somalia, not because they didn't take part. I think we were, uh, we defended ourselves, we defeated the Adbaris military here. But at least they should have realized that Somalia need their recognition. When Britain, the former colonial power, left Somaliland, the Cold War was raging. The Soviets and Americans were soon struggling for control of the entire region. The runway here is one of the longest in the world. It's four and a half kilometers long. And it was actually built during the Cold War by the Soviets. Uh, the Soviets kept heavy bombers here. And in the late 1970s, the Soviet Union switched allegiance from Somalia to Ethiopia, and the Russians were asked to leave. And in their place, in came the Americans. And the Americans actually decided to use this runway because it was so long as an emergency landing strip for the NASA space shuttle. And they paid about $40 million a year rent just in case the shuttle ever got into any trouble and couldn't make it back to America. Can you see the, the dust devils? There's one, two, the second one splitting into two. Are they dangerous? No, they... They're just dust. Yeah, it's dust. They cover you in dust. There are roughly three and a half million Somalilanders. The economy is still recovering after the war, and the lives of most people are centered around their cattle, sheep, and goats. They are buying and selling. They negotiate through the fingers. <laughs> so what, what have you just bought? Can we ask? For that group of livestock, each head $30. So this is six? Six. Seven. Seven. Eight. Nine. No, uh, nine, five, four, four three, five, four, two, two. Yeah. What did I just, did I just buy anything? No, you didn't. I didn't buy anything, OK. In the last few years, Somaliland has been hit hard by drought. As crops have failed, tens of thousands of people are believed to be at risk from starvation. When was the last time you had rain? Two years. Ah. Two years. Ah. This is the worst drive in 30 years. Are people receiving any help from the outside world? No. Not None at all. Not at all. Why not? Somaliland is not a recognized country. We cannot have access to international aid. Even emergency. We travelled on to Hargeisa, the capital of Somaliland. The city was emptied and virtually destroyed during the war, but Somalilanders have worked hard to rebuild. It now bustles with activity and families have returned. When we were in Mogadishu, people talked quite lovingly almost about traffic lights, how they used to have them in Mogadishu and how people used to come in from the outside country to actually just look at the bright lights, the beautiful lights. And now, all the traffic lights in Mogadishu have been destroyed. So as soon as we arrive here, it's quite weird to see traffic lights and cars stopping at them and obeying the rules. It's a sign that there's a government here. There's order. Unfortunately, everybody obeys the lights here. Now they've turned green, our driver has vanished. <laughs> this fighter plane just here. So what, what is this a memorial to? The bombardment that took place in Hargeisa in 1988. So this plane was used to bomb this city? Yes. How many people died during the bombardment? According to human rights organizations, 50,000 people. 50,000? But I believe more died. That's why people are very, uh, feel strongly about being independent, so that such things don't happen again. Fatima Ibrahim lived in Wales before returning to her homeland. She now documents the mass graves of Somalilanders killed by Somali troops. 
This was all farmland. The farmland has stopped because each time the farmer brings in the bulldozer to try and uh, cultivate his land, they come up with bones. Fatima, is this a, are these human remains here? That looks like a, a hip bone, the top of the skull and part of the spinal cord. The executions took place there. Their hands that were tied behind their backs, then the soldiers would come in and they would machine gun them. There's a grave there. This particular mass grave extends up all the way around the river here, as far as the eye can see. All along the bank, they've uncovered scores of bodies. Soldiers loyal to Mohammed Siad Barry committed appalling crimes against the people of Somaliland. Fatima took me to another grave. At this particular spot, we have the, the remains of 11 students, all under the age of 17. We know that by the smallness of, of their bones. What happened was the 26th military section went to the secondary school in Hargeisa and randomly took 11 students. And what they did was they took them to the 26th section and they literally just bled them dry. Uh, once, they had, uh, once they died, uh, their remains were was buried here, as you can see. So just so we understand, the students who've been buried here, they were, they were, they were basically used as blood banks by soldiers to provide blood for other wounded soldiers. And then when they were bled dry, almost literally, uh -huh. their bodies were just thrown out mm -hmm. like garbage or something. Yeah. And you have to remember, this is the 11 that we know about. Unlike Mogadishu, the capital of Somaliland seems quite organised. The local hospital is named after its founder. You, know, you, might, you might just be in time for a baby to be born. Let, let me just... Let me... I'll wait here. <laughs> Somaliland's latest citizen, a four and a half kilo baby boy had just arrived. But Edna's hospital also cares for other patients. This child was born with a congenital heart problem. He needs surgery. He needs a heart operation. Anywhere else it wouldn't be that difficult. What do you need? Well, we need the expertise and we need the facility to be able to carry out an open heart surgery. None of that is available in Somaliland. Is that partly because you're not recognised? We don't exist. Cardiologists won't come here to work with us because they, they think of us as Somalia. Um, so we're just trying to keep this child as healthy as we can and hoping that one day somebody will, will give him a heart operation. Is it really as simple as that? You yeah, know, that yes. Because Somaliland isn't recognised, yeah, yeah. people won't come to treat Mohammed? Yes. Yeah. Edna used to live in Mogadishu with her politician husband. I was building another hospital in Mogadishu, by the way. Some warlord with a gun has it. I left my house. Another warlord has it. I left a farm. A third warlord has it. And if I tried to claim all the property I had in Mogadishu, I would have to fight four different warlords. I prefer to stay alive. <laughs> So where are we now? We're in the presidency. So this is the president's office building? The president's building, offices, cabinet meeting. Edna is also the foreign minister of Somaliland. Wow. So we're just interrupting. Salam alaikum. So we can see here, this is the meeting of the Somaliland government. All the senior politicians and Edna, who we're just with, is, is over here. I think we should leave you to run the country and we will go outside. But thank you very much for letting us see. Thank you, Mr. President. That was quite an incredible sight to see the government of a place that officially doesn't exist 
actually in operation. The government ministers all sitting down around the table. And the irony is that this building that they're in actually used to be the home of one of the leading Somali warlords, and now it's the seat of government for Somaliland. Is the president. Hello. Salam alaikum, Mr. President. Nice Lovely to meet you. Nice Thank you for agreeing to see us. It's very kind of you. What's your national budget? Whatever we get. <laughs> we have no choice. <laughs> Whatever we get. How, how much do you get, roughly? Uh, roughly Approximately. Uh, roughly this year it was 30 million. 30 million. Is that enough? It's not enough, but we, we, are, we are satisfied whatever we get, because <laughs> all the people are making sacrifice. Sometimes we use it to get five million, and we use it to run this country. You can run the country so on the, five million? Because by sacrifice. All the people, they are making sacrifice. The UN is helping to train Somaliland's new police force, and Fatima Ibrahim invited me to see the recruits. A lot of these uh, police officers used to be soldiers or guerrilla fighters, and some of them were even sort of security guards for some of the clans, so they were basically tribal warriors. And they've been turned in the space of a few months with help from the United Nations into quite an effective police force. Do you think there's any irony in the fact that the United Nations is helping to train police officers for a country and a government that they don't recognize? No, not really, because uh, as far as we're concerned in uh, UNDP, this is, this, this is part of the humanitarian assistance that we can give. And why, um, why is this man throwing stones at these officers? That he's training them <laughs> that if a, ri a riot uh, breaks out, then people will be throwing stones at them. This is part of our humanitarian assistance. Without this kind of protection, then we would have to rely on militia groups and uh, armed guards. Like they do in Somalia. Yes. And also what it does, it, it gives role models to the children. So instead of having a children that's growing up in a society of armed conflict, it, you've got a, a, a generation of, 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 of children who are growing up in a, in a society of war and order. Somalia and Somaliland are both Islamic nations. Militant groups are emerging here, and I'd heard there were al-Qaeda terrorists in jail who'd attacked foreigners in Somaliland. So Yusuf, who are these men? They belong to al Ittihad, which is closely linked to al-Qaeda. So their followers have been known. That's right. And what have they been? What crimes have they been responsible for? Uh, they have been responsible for the killing of uh, a Kenyan lady uh, in last March, and also they confessed taking part in the killing of two British couples. They could be also have a link to uh, the killing of an Italian aid worker who was killed in October last year. Officials here claim the men travelled from Mogadishu to launch their attacks. Somaliland isn't an obvious tourist destination, but it does have a tourism minister who wanted Yusuf and me to see one of his favourite sites, however hard it was to get to. Somaliland is home to ancient rock paintings, at least 5,000 years old. Ah. Here, is the, here is the cow, and person, you know, always under the cow. Mm. That means the people, they were bringing the cow. They, they were, were praying yeah, to the cow. Yeah, they... This is the horns of the cow, you can just see there. And then inside, this is a, 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 a baby, a baby cow, yes. that's still inside the mother waiting to be born. These figures here are humans, and they've realised that they're lying prostrate or praying underneath the cows, and they seem convinced that in this area then, three, four thousand years before Christ, they were the humans lived here who worshipped cows. You can see all these pictures, the pictures are amazing. They, they say this picture is the best that they have seen. It's to 
totally undeveloped at the moment. This is not a tourist destination, at least yet. If there was, then there would probably be some stairs. Next on my tour was a trip to a local zoo. I'm not sure what the RSPCA would say about this place. First we will see this one, this one. <laughs> Are they quite tame? This uh, gentleman has put his hand into the lion's mouth. Uh, I won't be doing that. <laughs> How long have you had them? This is about, uh, I think it's five months, this one. But there's four years I had that, the big one. There's a big one uh -huh. as well? This one, this small. Be careful, maybe he will jump from here. <laughs> Did you hear that? <laughs> he said, be careful or the lion <laughs> might jump on you. <laughs> this lioness is actually one of the lucky ones because most of the animals in Somaliland were killed and eaten by soldiers and civilians as well during the civil war. As a guerrilla commander, Yusuf spent more than a decade in the bush fighting Somali wow. forces. Yusuf was just saying that when they were, when he was a guerrilla fighter, they used to hide behind these termite mounds when the government troops were attacking them and the government troops' bullets wouldn't go through. They'd be safe behind them. They're, th they're that strong. <laughs> but you managed to get some. There we go. Oh, good. Does it look good? Good. Should we try it? Yes. Have you drunk it all? Nothing left for you. <laughs> Yusuf, I was enjoying that. <laughs> Somalilanders are proud of their independence, but they worry other countries are trying to force them into a new union with Somalia. The international community should uh, uh, realize that they just cannot impose on us a, a form of government which we don't want, mm. and that's unification with reunification with Somalia. If uh, it came to it, do you think you would be prepared to fight again to protect Somaliland? Can you imagine a situation where that where you would fight again? I hope it doesn't happen, but uh, if. If Somaliland's independence is threatened, I have no doubt that the whole nation will rise up if we are not accepted as members of the international community. That will be another suffering. And I don't think we deserve that. Then I will have no option except to fight. Hello. Are majestic, proud animals. The way they, they walk, the way they look at people, as if nobody else is important except them. It's very true that they do, yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a presenter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'll make it on the telly, guaranteed. British.